OK, so uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome back um, from the entire uh, TMS team. Um, today we are going to introduce you a topic that uh, of uh, increasing interest in the scientific community, and I'm talking about aging. So I'm sure that uh, each of you <laughs> have wondered uh, what makes your body age, or for example, your skin wrinkle or your hair uh, turns to white. And today, uh, biologist Elizabeth uh, Blackburn, uh, sorry, Blackburn uh, shares a Nobel Prize for her work and uh, finding out the answer. Moreover, um, so she's an um, Australian born American molecular biologist and biochemist who uh, was awarded in 2009 um, Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine along with uh, Dr. Grader and uh, Dr. Uh, so, sorry, so stuck for the discovery she's talking about today. Uh, moreover, we will have a second video in which uh, we will see how through uh, artificial intelligence, scientists are trying to deeply understand the aging process and uh, to find a way to delay uh, this process and make the quality of life better during life. So, uh, good viewing. And uh, see you later for the question and answer. Please uh, don't be shy. It's an, um, an, an open discussion. So all the questions and curiosities are welcome. Where does the, the end, end begin? begin? Well, for, for me, me it, all it all began, began with this, this little, little fellow. fellow. This, this adorable <laughs> organism, well, I think it's adorable, is called Tetrahymena, and it's a single-celled creature. Uh, it's also been known as pond scum. So that's right, my career started with pond scum. Now, it was no surprise I became a scientist. Uh, growing up far away from here, as a little girl, I was deadly curious about everything alive. I used to pick up lethally poisonous stinging jellyfish and sing to them. <laughs> and, and so, starting my career, uh, I was deadly curious about fundamental mysteries of the most basic building blocks of life. And I was fortunate to live in a society where that curiosity was valued. Now, for me, this little pond scum critter tetrahymena was a great way to study the fundamental mystery I was most curious about, those bundles of DNA in our cells called chromosomes. And it was because I was curious about the very ends of chromosomes, known as telomeres. Now, when I started my quest, all we knew was that they help protect the ends of chromosomes. It was important when cells divide. It was really important. But I wanted to find out what telomeres consisted of. And for that, I needed a lot of them. And it so happens that cute little tetrahymena has a lot of short linear chromosomes, around 20,000, so lots of telomeres. And I discovered that telomeres consisted of special segments of non-coding DNA right at the very ends of chromosomes. But here's a problem. Now, we all start life as a single cell. It multiplies to two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, and on and on to form the 200 million billion cells that make up our adult body. And some of those cells have to divide thousands of times. In fact, even as I stand here before you, all throughout my body, cells are furiously replenishing to well, keep me standing here before you. So every time a cell divides, all of its DNA has to be copied, all of the coding DNA inside of those chromosomes, because that carries the vital operating instructions that keep our cells in good working order. So uh, my heart cells can keep a steady beat, which I assure you they're not doing right now. And, and my immune cell cells can fight off uh, you know, bacteria and viruses and, and our brain cells can save the memory of our first kiss and keep on learning throughout life. But there is a glitch in the way D 
DNA is copied. It is just one of those facts of life. Every time the cell divides and the DNA is copied, some of that DNA from the ends gets worn down and shortened, some of that telomere DNA. And uh, think about it, like the protective caps at the ends of your shoelace, they, and those keep the shoelace or the chromosome from fraying. And when that tip gets too short, it falls off, and that worn down telomere sends a signal to the cells. The DNA is no longer being protected, sends a signal, time to die. So, end of story. Well, sorry, this <laughs> not so fast. Can't be the end of the story, because life hasn't died off the face of the Earth. So, I was curious. If such wear and tear is inevitable, how on Earth does Mother Nature make sure we can keep our chromosomes intact? Now, remember that little pond scum critter, Tetrahymena? Its craziest thing was tetrahymena cells never got old and died. Their telomeres weren't shortening as time marched on. Sometimes they even got longer. Something else was at work, and believe me, that something was not in any textbook. So working in my lab with my extraordinary student, Carol Greider, and Carol and I shared the Nobel Prize for this work, we began running experiments. And we discovered that cells do have something else. It was a previously undreamed of enzyme that could replenish, make longer, telomeres. And we named it telomerase. And when we removed our pond scum's telomerase, their telomeres ran down and they died. So it was thanks to their plentiful telomerase that our pond scum critters never got old. Okay, now that's incredibly hopeful message for us humans to be receiving from pond scum, because it turns out that as we humans age, our telomeres do shorten, and, and remarkably, that shortening is aging us. Generally speaking, the longer your telomeres, the better off you are. It's the overshortening of telomeres that leads us to see, uh, feel and see signs of aging. Uh, my skin cells start to die, and I start to see fine lines, wrinkles. Hair pigment cells die. You start to see gray. Immune system cells die. You increase your risks of getting sick. In fact, the cumulative research from the last 20 years has made clear that telomere attrition is contributing to our risks of getting cardiovascular diseases, Alzheimer's, some cancers, and diabetes the very conditions many of us die of. And so we have to think about this. <laughs> what is going on? This attrition, we look and we feel older. Yeah, our telomeres are losing the war of attrition faster. In those of us who feel youthful longer, it turns out our telomeres are staying longer for longer periods of time, extending our period feelings of youthfulness and reducing the risks of all we most dread as the birthdays go by. Okay, seems like a no-brainer. Now, if my telomeres are connected to how quickly I'm going to feel and get old, if my telomeres can be renewed by my telomerase, then all I have to do to reverse the signs and symptoms of aging, is figure out where to buy that Costco-sized bottle of grade A all-organic fair trade telomerase, right? Great, problem solved. Not so fast, I'm sorry, alas, that's not the case. Okay, and why? It's because human genetics has taught us that when it comes to our telomerase, we humans live on a knife edge. Okay, simply put, yes, nudging up telomerase does decrease the risks of some diseases, but it also increases the risks of certain and rather nasty cancers. So even if you could buy that Costco-sized bottle of telomerase, and, and there are many websites uh, with markets, you know, marketing such dubious products. Problem is, you could nudge up your risks of cancers. And we don't want that. 
Now, don't worry. And because, well, I think it's kind of funny that、uh, right now, you know, many of us may be thinking, I'd rather be like pond scum. <laughs> right. In... <laughs> There is something for us humans in the story of telomeres and their maintenance, but I want to get one thing clear: it isn't about enormously extending human lifespan or, or immortality. It's about health span. Now, health span is the number of years of your life when you're free of disease, you're healthy, you're、um, productive, you're zestfully enjoying life. Disease span, the opposite of health span, is the time of your life spent feeling old and sick and dying. So. The real question becomes: Okay, if I can't guzzle telomerase, do I have control over my telomeres' length and, hence, my well-being, my health, without those downsides of cancer risks? Okay. So it's it's the year 2000. Now, I've been minutely scrutinizing little teeny tiny telomeres very happily for many years. When into my lab walks a psychologist named Elisa Eppel. Now, Elisa's expertise is in the effects of severe chronic psychological stress on our minds and our bodies' health. And as she was standing in my lab, which, which ironically overlooked the entrance to a mortuary, and <laughs> and and she had a life and death question for me: What happens to telomeres in people who are chronically stressed? She asked me. You see, she'd been studying caregivers and specifically mothers of children with a chronic condition, be it gut disorder, be it autism, you, you name it. A group obviously under enormous and prolonged psychological stress. I have to say, her question changed me profoundly. See, all this time I'd been thinking of telomeres. As those minuscule molecular structures that they are, and the genes that control telomeres. And when Elisa asked me about studying caregivers, I suddenly saw telomeres in a whole new, a whole new light. I saw beyond the genes and the chromosomes into the lives of the real people we were studying. And I'm a mom myself, and at that moment I was struck by the image of these women. Dealing with their child with a condition very difficult to deal with, often without help, and such women simply often look worn down. So, was it possible their telomeres were worn down as well? So, our collective curiosity went into overdrive. Elisa selected for our first study a group of such caregiving mothers, and we wanted to ask. What's the length of their telomeres compared with the number of years that they have been caregiving for their child with a chronic condition? So, four years go by, and the day comes when all the results are in. And Elisa looked down at our first scatter plot and literally gasped, because there was a pattern to the data, and it was the exact gradient. That we most feared might exist. It was right there on the page. The longer, the more years that is, a mother had been in this caregiving situation, no matter her age, the shorter were her telomeres, and the more she perceived her situation as being more stressful, the lower was her telomerase, and the shorter were her telomeres. So we had. Discovered something unheard of: the more chronic stress you're under, the shorter your telomeres. Meaning, the more likely you were to fall victim to an early disease span and perhaps untimely death. Our findings meant that people's life events and the way we respond to these events can change how you maintain your telomeres. So, telomere length wasn't just A matter of age, counting in years. And this is question to me back when she first came to my lab. Indeed, it'd been a life and death question. Now, luckily, hidden in that data, there was hope. We noticed that some mothers, despite having 
been care from caring for their children for many years had been able to maintain their telomeres. So studying these women closely revealed that they were resilient to stress. Somehow they were able to experience their circumstances not as a threat day in and day out, but as a challenge. And this has led to a very important insight for all of us. We have control over the way we age all the way down into our cells. Okay, now our initial curiosity became infectious. Thousands of scientists from different fields added their expertise to telomere research. And the findings have poured in. It's up to over 10,000 scientific papers and counting. So several studies rapidly confirmed our initial finding that, yes, chronic stress is bad for telomeres. And now many are revealing that we have more control over this particular aging process than any of us could ever have imagined. Um, a few examples. A study from the University of California, Los Angeles, of people who are caring for a relative with dementia long term and looked at their caregiver's uh, telomere maintenance capacity and found that it was improved by them practicing a form of meditation for as little as 12 minutes a day for two months. Attitude matters. Now, if you're habitually a negative thinker, you typically see a stressful situation with a threat stress response, meaning uh, if your boss wants to see you, you automatically think I'm about to be fired and your blood vessels constrict and your level of the stress hormone cortisol creeps up and then it stays up and over time, that persistently high level of the cortisol actually damps down your telomerase, not good for your telomeres. On the other hand, if you typically see something stressful as a challenge to be tackled, then blood flows to your heart and to your brain, and you experience a brief but energizing spike of cortisol. And thanks to that habitual bring-it-on attitude, your telomeres do just Fine. So, what is all of this telling us? You telomeres do just fine. You really do have power to change what is happening to your own telomeres. But our curiosity just got more and more intense because we started to wonder, what about factors outside our own skin? Could they impact our telomere maintenance as well? You know, we humans are intensely social beings. Is it even possible that our telomeres were social as well? And the results have been startling. As early as childhood, emotional neglect, exposure to violence, bullying and racism all impact telomeres, and the effects are long-term. Can you imagine the impact on children of living years in a war zone? People who can't trust their neighbors and who don't feel safe in their neighbor neighborhoods consistently have shorter telomeres. So your home address matters for telomeres as well. On the flip side, tight-knit communities, being in a marriage long-term, and uh, lifelong friendships, even all improve telomere maintenance. So what is all this telling us? It's telling us that I have the power to impact my own telomeres and I also have the power to impact yours. Telomere science has told us just how interconnected we all are. But I'm still curious. <laughs> I. I do wonder what legacy all of us will leave for the next generation. Will we invest in the next young woman or man peering through a microscope at next little critter, the next bit of pond scum, curious about a question we don't even know today is a question? It could be a great question that could impact all the world. And maybe, maybe you're curious about, about you. Now that you know how to protect your telomeres, are you curious? What are you going to do with all those 
decades of brimming good health. And now that you know you, you can impact the telomeres of others, are you curious? How will you make a difference? And now that you know the power of curiosity to change the world, how will you make sure that the world invests in curiosity for the sake of the generations that will come after us? Thank you. Thank you. Aging is a huge health, societal, and economical burden that is marked by a decline in an organism's physiological activities. Many diseases, including malignancies, cardiovascular diseases, and neurological diseases, are linked to advancing age. AI has found anti-aging technology. Want to know more? Keep watching! Hi, my name is Alex and welcome to AI News Daily. In this video, we will be looking at the top AI anti-aging technology. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notifications. Let's get started. Though chronological aging cannot be reversed, artificial intelligence may soon assist us in slowing biological aging, which is impacted by lifestyle, behavior, and other factors, and is a more accurate predictor of health and mortality. We can easily guess someone's age by looking at them, hearing them speak, or even smelling them. These are all symptoms of biological aging. Even a layperson's eye, let alone a doctor's, may be able to detect a person's health status if they appear older than their chronological age. AI's ability to absorb and analyze massive volumes of data makes it a valuable ally in the quest to not just discover aging indicators before they manifest biologically, but also to help people live longer, healthier lives. Through patterns in medical data, photographs, and other sources, AI can recognize trends and determine casualties. AI algorithms evaluated daily images of mice to extract probable aging markers and build lifetime management methods in a project with mice. The same visual biomarker learning mechanism can subsequently be applied to other species, including humans. Beyond picture analysis tools, AI can detect biomarkers by identifying recurring patterns in human aging. AI can detect aging trends in different populations by sifting through large amounts of data from various blood tests, retinal scans, muscle analysis, and other sources, or by comparing human data to that of other species. AI can offer health solutions in addition to recognizing prospective difficulties by studying the effects of therapeutic treatments, preventive remedies, different lifestyles, and more. On a deeper level, understanding how proteins and cells respond favorably or adversely to therapies allows AI to aid in the efficient development of medicine. Deep Learning's capability could soon assist us in alleviating the discomforts of biological aging. A team of Surrey chemists developed a machine learning model based on data from the DrugAge database to predict whether a compound can extend the life of Canorhabditis elegans, a translucent worm with a metabolism similar to humans according to a paper published in Nature Communications Scientific Reports. Due to the worm's short lifespan, the researchers were able to observe the effects of the chemical compounds. The AI identified three chemicals that have an 80% likelihood of extending the lifespan of elegans. Flavonoids, which are antioxidant pigments found in plants that enhance cardiovascular health, fatty acids like omega-3, and organooxygens, which include carbon-to-oxygen connections and include alcohol. Sofia Capsiani, one of the study's co-authors and a final-year undergraduate student at the University of Surrey, said, In modern medicine, aging is increasingly being recognized as a series of diseases, and we may use digital technologies like AI to assist slowing down or preventing aging and age-related diseases. Our research reveals AI's groundbreaking ability to aid in the identification of anti-aging chemicals. This research highlights the power and promise of AI which is a specialization of the University of Surrey to generate huge advances in human health, stated Dr. Brendan Howland, main author of the study and senior lecturer in computational chemistry at the University of Surrey. Many disorders, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, and neurological diseases are linked to aging. 
an emerging study topic is pharmaceutical interventions that slow down the aging process and delay the onset of age-related illnesses. The goal of this work was to create a machine learning model based on the drug age database's data to predict whether a chemical substance would lengthen the life of Caner habditis worms. The random forest approach was used to create five predictive models with molecular fingerprints and or molecular descriptors as features. For categorizing the substances in the test set, the best performing classifier created using molecular descriptors achieved an area under the curve score of 0.815. The random forest algorithm's genie significance measure was used to rank the model's features. Descriptors relating to atom and bond counts, topological and partial charge qualities were among the top 30 attributes. In an external database of 1,738 small molecules, the model was used to predict the class of compounds. The screening database is chemical compounds with a predictive probability of 0.80 for enhancing cane or habditis worm longevity were divided into flavonoids, fatty acids and conjugates, and organooxygen compounds. Interventions that target the cellular and molecular processes of aging have the potential to prevent and delay age-related diseases. Using food limitations, genetic alterations, and pharmaceutical interventions, Several aging studies have revealed interventions that prolong the lifetime of model species ranging from nematodes and fruit flies to rodents. In the multicellular species Caner habditis elegans, Lee et al. revealed the first evidence that long-term nutritional deprivation can promote longevity. Harrison et al. discovered that treating mice with rapamycin, an inhibitor of the mTOR system, increased the median and maximum longevity of the mice a few years later. Salman et al. also discovered that genetic deletion of S6 protein kinase 1, a component of the mTOR signaling system, extended the lifespan of mice and protected them from age-related diseases. To find pharmacological classes relevant to C. elegans aging, Yi et al. created a pharmacological network. Resistance to oxidative stress and lifespan extension were shown to be grouped in a few pharmacological classes, the majority of which were connected to intercellular signaling. Putin et al. also created a deep learning neural network that could predict human chronological age based on a simple blood test. Albumin, glucose, alkaline phosphatase, urea, and erythrocytes were found to be the top five most important blood markers for establishing chronological age in humans. Mamushina et al. also built a deep learning based hematological aging clock with millions of patients using blood samples from Canadian, South Korean, and Eastern European populations. The findings revealed that population-specific aging clocks were more accurate than generic aging clocks in predicting chronological age and defining biological age. Based on the data from the Drug Age database, Berardo et al. created a random forest model to predict if a chemical will increase the lifespan of C. elegans. Molecular descriptors and gene onatology terms were employed to construct the model. The random forest's feature importance measure was used to choose features. The best performing model was used to predict the class of compounds in the GDI-DB database with an AUC score of 0.80. This study expands on Berardo et al.'s work by looking at the usage of the drug age database to forecast molecules with anti-aging capabilities. The random forest technique was used to determine whether a substance will prolong the lifespan of C. elegans. Based on the data from the drug age database released by Berardo et al., five predictive models were built, each using distinct descriptor categories. Molecular fingerprints and or molecular descriptors calculated from the structure of the substances in the drug age database were used to create the models. Variants and mutual information-based approaches were used to choose features. To our knowledge, this is the first time molecular fingerprints have been used to develop machine learning models based on drug age database entries. The best model was used to predict the class of chemicals in an external database, which included 1,738 small molecules retrieved from the drug bank database. Random Forest is a supervised machine learning technique that consists of an ensemble of decision trees, each of which is trained separately using a random subset of data. Because it is resistant to overfitting on high-dimensional datasets with limited sample sizes, the random forest model is commonly used in chemo and bioinformatics activities. The chemical descriptors used in quantitative structure activity relationship models can have a big impact on their quality and predictions. 
Descriptors are computer-interpretable digital or numerical representations of chemical information of molecules that are ideal for model creation. The Molecular Operating Environment software was used to construct 2D and 3D molecular descriptors in this investigation. 2D descriptors are derived from a molecule's 2D structure and give data on its structural, topological, and physiochemical features. 3D descriptors, on the other hand, are derived from a chemical compound's 3D structure and include electronic parameters, quantum chemical descriptors, and surface-to-volume descriptors. Molecular fingerprints use binary vectors to indicate a molecule's structure, with one indicating the presence of a feature or structural group and zero indicating its absence. The RDKit Python environment was used to generate extended connectivity fingerprints of 1024 and 2048 bits, as well as RDKit topological fingerprints of 2048 bits. Finally, the use of molecular descriptors in conjunction with ECFPs was investigated to choose a subset of significant variables for predicting the anti-aging capabilities of the compounds in the dataset, researchers used variance and mutual information filter-based approaches. Only the training set, which contained 80% of the chemicals in the dataset, was used for this. The number of variables employed by each model was reduced as a result of feature selection, lowering the cost of computational calculations. For identifying the chemicals in the test set, the feature subset with the greatest AUC score in tenfold cross-validation was chosen. When two feature subsets with the same AUC score were employed, the subset with the lowest standard deviation was chosen. With that, we have come to the end of the video. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button. Okay, so um, I hope that uh, you enjoy the videos. Uh, I know the hand of the second one is uh, quite difficult for um, the ones that are not, um, let's say, uh, informatics or very expert in AI. But I think uh, both of them are very interesting. And here we have, if you have some questions specifically on the second part, we, we have uh, Professor De Gasparis that um, was so kind to help me with the discussion with the second part. So please feel free to um, write your question in the chat or just unmute yourself and uh, say whatever you think, whatever you want to share with us. So uh, first of all, I would like to say that it's so, so interesting that, that uh, artificial intelligence have, um, with artificial in intelligence, we have the possibility to go deeply in uh, this kind of, um, let's say, systemic um, disease as the aging is. So first of all, I think because uh, find a biomarker that, um, normally is used to define a specific uh, part of the physiology or a pathological condition. But uh, since aging is a systemic degeneration of many physiological condition, till now um, there aren't predefined biomarkers to measure aging. So uh, AI is a very power, a powerful tool, I think, to to find, first of all, biomarkers that could be used for many, many um, applications such as uh, identification of targets to increase to um, improve the quality of life of the um, of, of people and also to find uh, personalized treatments for such pathologies uh, i don't know if uh, professor de gasparis have some question about this or some comment and uh, we can discuss that we can discuss hear me well um, yes. <clears throat> yes first of all some uh, comments about the two talk the two videos the first one is more related to basic biology of aging uh, and this uh, telomeres uh, and uh, telomere uh, damaging over over the years and then uh, uh, investigating how also uh, st stress over the lifetime of an individual, even physical, then also psychological stress as an impact on aging through those uh, uh, 
telomere been uh, damaged. This is very, very interesting because the second video, on the other hand, is more related to uh, chemistry that can help to um, defend against this uh, damage. So and the, I see that, that they are completely complementary. The first one is about uh, a, a lifetime of an individual that can receive stress. And uh, the second one is talking about some new pharmaceutical that may help you to defend yourself against those damages uh, originated by the stress. So my question would be, maybe it's a philosophical question, do we want to be more stressed in our lifetime? So do we, do, are we searching for a pharma, pharmaceutical to uh, let us to be more productive and more stressed without dying soon? <laughs> That's the bottom line. But uh, I don't know if you can answer, but uh, it's a provoking question for yeah, students. Yeah, I know, I know. I also think about this. <laughs> I think it's a million uh, dollar question because, you know, uh, today the life is so hard and uh, we are under stress every day. But um, I think, um, yeah, for sure it's useful to prevent uh, the stress and the uh, factors that can stress our body is very useful. <laughs> for all pathologies, it's better to prevent than cure, you know, I think. But um, also to... Um, let's say, define and understand what is the um, biological age of a body um, through AI is very interesting because maybe you can start to prevent earlier the damages uh, based on your stress, based on your lifestyle. Maybe you can realize, okay, I'm so stressed, I'm going older and older for some reason. And also, um, I think um, it's very nice to maybe the part to compare organisms uh, that they are talking about. Because, for example, we can merge the two talks, as, as you told, as you told, Professor. Also, studying the this organism that the first uh, woman is is talking about, so uh, tetra tetra imina, if I remember well, uh, studying is and and also compare it by AI with humans or other organisms could be nice to understand how they can are they able to don't get old, you know, compared to us. Maybe there is not only the telomere uh, or telomerase uh, reason. There are other reasons that could be prevent and. Also, we can deeply understand aging and maybe could be um, help us to prevent some pathologies, some, sure. some pathology that maybe now we are trying to study and we don't know really what is the cause or many causes. So, yeah. yeah, I think that AI for sure cannot replace scientists, but is a very important, um, let's say, starting point or validated point uh, that can give us another point of view. No? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, I, I do agree uh, on the prevention uh, action because uh, uh, knowing which uh, life condition and uh, pharmaceutical or, or food can help us to reduce stress definitely helps prevention of uh, illness and uh, not well being. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this AI, uh, well, it, the video was quite kind of fast on many concepts. <laughs> Maybe I should give a little bit of uh, clarification or yes, something. Yes, please. Uh, he, 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 the guy was talking a lot about this uh, random forest uh, model. Uh, it's nothing to do with the actual trees. Uh, it's just a mathematical model uh, made by rules, uh, logical rules that are like, for example, if uh, such feature X and Y is less than uh, 0 0.7 uh, in this interval or whatever, then um, the classification is most probably Z. So there are a set of rules, and you can imagine rules as trees, because there may be a main rule that is the root under which there are many sub-intervals, sub-variables, uh, in which uh, each rule applies, each other different rules applies, and so on, each sub-rule can have a sub-tree. So in this way, 
you build a, a, a tree, uh, it's called the decision tree, which means I give an input and uh, I see which rules will activate uh, and so that uh, I will end up uh, with the, an output which are zeros, zeros and ones of uh, all, all the rules that have been activated. And so I can uh, relate that uh, string of bits uh, to the class that I'm going to classify. Mm -hmm. the, the forest means that you have many trees, <laughs> which means you have so many uh, decision trees in parallel that uh, uh, given us a, a combination of uh, input features, uh, only one of those will be the best that will match the results that you're searching for. So they will, be, they will apply the, to molecular recognition, classification for example if you just apply if you read the database uh, which is already in a, in informatic uh, in computer code right uh, of um, um, aging drug resistant uh, i don't remember exactly the, the technical name so i apologize but there, there is a database with the, some chemicals and so the some researcher have applied for a, a random forest to learn the, um, the, the function of that chemical uh, related to its uh, uh, molecular sequence or its uh, spatial interaction, its uh, two-dimensional uh, distribution. Yes, sure. The volume, or, the dimension, yes. Yeah. Yes, I got it. So it's a kind of many filters, no? And yeah. the, one, the molecule that passes the filters just is the best, or let's say the, the group of molecules. Well, there is one one topic is uh, called feature engineering, mm -hmm. which means if I have a large table of uh, features, num numerical features, labels, uh, measurements of something, for example, a molecule, then I need to understand which one of those feature will best classify my output, okay? To be, for example, against aging or uh, neutral to aging. Okay, mm -hmm. one bit, zero or one, okay? Zero means neutral, one is anti-aging. So you need to understand if you have 1,000 features, over those 1,000 features, how many are the real important features to be anti-aging? Mm -hmm. That's called the feature engineering. And mm -hmm. it was cited in the video as well. And there are many, many studies. Others have been uh, studying uh, the biological function directly in the living being and in different species, probably in mouses and other animals, mm -hmm. to see how the correlation between the molecular description and uh, the biological phenomena, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, it's like a black box. You don't really, from the computer point of view, you don't really know what's going on inside, right? It's all the complexity of uh, molecular biology, uh, pathways, uh, genetics, uh, proteins, uh, the computer doesn't care. It just wants to associate the molecular properties, features, to the biological function. Mm -hmm. And so, so basically, sorry, because I have a question. So basically, is, is an AI yeah, mm, tool, but at the beginning, there is the human hands <laughs> that decide this tree or, let's say, train this uh, AI before, otherwise <laughs> you can have data, but you cannot trust it, right? Uh, okay, there are two, many questions in one. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Thing is, uh, one is the model training and uh, selection to understand what is the best machine learning model to apply to your data. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, sometimes it's done also with another AI, which is called the auto machine learning, which has been trained to select the best AI to do a task. Okay. So Google is also publishing papers on that, uh, mostly applied to natural language processing, which is not very different from molecular analysis because it's an analysis of sequences of characters and words. So it's very similar, uh, can be applied. And your other question was about trust. Well, uh, you you should never trust a black box, first mm. of all. Um, 
But uh, these days, uh, uh, in my research field, uh, uh, we are talking about explainable AI, which means if your box can explain why it's, classif it's classifying something in a way, X instead of Y, or uh, instead of Z, or instead of W, uh, then if, uh, if the box can explain itself, then it's more trustable AI than yeah, sure. other AI, which is a black box. Yeah, makes sense. So uh, just for the audience, I publish in the chat uh, the links of the uh, papers that they uh, are uh, speaking of in the, in the um, video, especially in the second ones. So if you are uh, curious about this, you just copy and paste or click the link and you can read and uh, go deeply in this it's because, you know, in half an hour it's so hard <laughs> to explain and to yeah. know everything about AI. <laughs> I think it's a very interesting but big, big uh, field. And um, yeah, what else? Uh, another interesting thing that I uh, find in the in the net is that uh, this is more um, um, uh, organism is the only, is not the only ones that never get hold. I find another that is the lobsters. So the lobsters uh, also do not experience an essence and uh, also because of the telomerase. So this enzyme that can repair the end of our chromosomes. And um, basically also humans have this enzyme, but uh, with, in the adult life we lose the ability to produce it or they are less functional. So uh, for this uh, kind of animal, uh, they continually um, produce this telomerase in a huge um, number, so they are able to, let's say, repair the ends. Uh, and unfortunately, um, they have this kind of um, exoskeleton that uh, is not able to grow um, with them. So uh, they are so uh, nice with the with the with the senescence, but they can't uh, have enough energy to produce uh, many 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 exoskeletons. So at the end, they will die for exhaustion uh, or shell collapse. So it's it's a kind of curiosity that I, that I found online. It's so ni it's nice to share with you. And. Can I, can I, uh, if there are no questions from the audience, I can, I can see. Yes. Uh, well, don't you think that nature actually uh, imposes a limit uh, even uh, in, in an immortal biology a system like that? Why it's, did nature impose this limit, do you mean? Somebody imposed a constraint, like to this living being. You cannot live more than that. Yes, even if sure. Well, um, what I can say, I don't know for sure why, but I can say that uh, is a kind of balance. For example, as the um, first scientist says, um, we are um, in, in, in an equilibrium. So, for example, cancer cells that are our cells of our body have a kind of dysregulation of this enzyme and they can live forever, but they are deregulated. So is a kind of balance. You cannot, uh, nature is balance, you know, so you cannot uh, have all <laughs> as you want, but uh, you can try to, you know, live better, not forever, but we can try to use these techniques, this stuff to live our life in the better way that we can. So don't experience exper less than we can of pathology, of all this pain stuff. And I think this should be the goal, not to live forever, because we can't. And I don't think that at least people want to live forever. I don't, I don't think it's so nice <laughs> also to to don't have, you know, end. And this is my point of view. I don't know what is yours. It's kind of philosophy. It's a lot by, by. Well, I think it's, uh, it's good for somebody who had a very good and long life to give space to young generations. Sure. You can, if we are to, if we can achieve a 200 years old life, what's going to happen to the society? Who's going to be at power? Mm. Or oh, the youngest uh, will ever be less and less important. 
if everybody's uh, older and older. It's already happening, basically. <laughs> yes, 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 sure. But I think it's, yeah, it's not this, this is not, should be the point. Okay. From in my opinion, and it's just to don't experience pain and you know diseases. Uh, maybe for also for younger because you know maybe someone can have uh, less <laughs> short telomeres and uh, experience uh, diseases as when they are younger or something like that. So maybe it could be also for these people to prevent or to have a healthier life. Yeah. And it's nice uh, if the most important thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also, do you have any data about your uh, experiments? Why not we try to do some AI, apply some AI to your data? Why not? <laughs> uh, we can uh, speak with uh, Professor Teddy and uh, for sure for me it should be very nice. And um, since we have a couple, mm, like eight minutes, seven minutes more, maybe I can just add you uh, the last things that I think about watching these videos, that um, I also search uh, something about the uh, personalized treatments, because this could be another big, huge problem, and um, something that uh, scientists are uh, looking for, for example, for pathologies like cancer again, because, you know, in, a can in cancers, uh, cancer is very heterogeneous, also the same cancer in the same pe person have different uh, cell type, different phenotypes. And it's, it's, it's so uh, hard to find one treatment. So with AI, um, people are trying to, um, to use it as a diagnostic tool, first of all, to reduce the rate of errors in the diagnosis. But also, it's, not, it's nice because they use also to uh, stratify patients and to uh, find the right uh, and uh, personalized treatment. So I think this could be a very interesting application for AI in uh, diagnostic and treatments for personalized med medicine. And it should be so nice if it's work. Okay. I don't, good, I, good I don't know if you hear something about this. Yeah, good proposal for a PhD student that would like to do the research on this. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Consider that the machine learning is only uh, uh, one subset of AI. Okay, so I'm I'm particularly more involved in robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, we have uh, different layers of AI on top of each other. So machine learning is considered to be the first level. It's called the perception level. Mm -hmm. It's like a vision system for humans. Okay. All right. Then uh, the, there is a higher level, which is a cognitive la layer, where you can uh, use other tools to make reasoning, to have a, a multi-agent system dedicated to different topics uh, and social interaction between agents. Uh, there are interesting books over the years. Uh, Marvin Minsky uh, has a model of mind made of a community of agents. So in that case, uh, you know, it would be interesting to apply this and other more complex architectures to medicine and to biology studies, yeah. which is a very rare approach, okay? Nowadays, everybody's just using the machine learning, which is the first step. Yeah, I think because it's more, I, for people, I think it's more uh, able to control, maybe, mm. no, to check. Because, <laughs> you know, we are like, uh, if we don't see, we don't trust. <laughs> also for the experiments, uh, is a kind of, I think for um, of our kind of field. And, but yeah, for sure it should be very nice if we can improve this and uh, be more and more involved in a, let's say, um, different scientists together to, to go on with the research in many fields. And for example, this is a very nice example with chemistry, and uh, computer science, biology, all together to make this possible. So I think this, the goal, this is the prayer goal. So, and I think we are close to the end. Since I can't see any question, comment or raise hand. And uh, I would like to 
Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Professor de Gasparis, for your help with the discussion and for your uh, all the information that you share with us. And um, please, um, uh, we can see each other next Tuesday. And uh, yeah, welcome back to the TMS. OK, have a nice new year. <laughs> you too. Thank you.